anticipate the coming of our Lord. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning as we listen to our good friend Bill play this morning's prelude. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here today. I'm Pastor Deanna, one of the pastors here at Shepherd of the Hills. We are so glad to see everyone here today. And if you're with us for the first time, we want you to know we are delighted that you have come to worship with us. This is a place of open hearts, open minds, and open doors. And we are grateful that you have come through our doors today. What do you think about all of the decorations here in this sanctuary? You like them? That is the handiwork of your worship committee. There was a whole crew of people here yesterday working from 9 in the morning until about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, making sure that we got all of the trees up and the advent wreath and all of the wonderful signs and symbols of this season that lead us to hearts that prepare for the coming of the Christ child. So thank you for the worship team and thank you for their hard work. It's our practice here at Shepherd of the Hills uh, to have everyone fill out a prayer and presence card. If you would fill that out and please drop that in the offering plate at the time of offering, that's very helpful to us. It's a great way for us to be able to stay in touch with you and a way for you to stay in touch with us. And also, if you're a first-time visitor today and you'd like to meet our church family, we'd love to introduce you. So in the pew rack in front of you, there is a pink welcome card. Feel free to fill that out, drop that in the offering plate at the time of offering, and we'll do the rest. We're just happy to have you here with us, and we'll introduce you a little bit later in our service. Now, there's one piece of the service this morning that you need to be aware of, and that is when we get to the lighting of the Advent wreath. 
There is a place, it'll come up on the screen, there is a place for you to respond. The response is, come Lord Jesus. And I just want us to practice that for a moment. So I'm going to gesture to you like that, and you say... Oh, wow, you're great at that. Okay, I think we're ready for worship, so let's stand now and let's sing some of our very favorite Advent hymns. Please be seated. Let us join our hearts in prayer. As we enter this holy season of Advent, O oh God, send a confident hope into our moments of worry and anxiety. Enrich us spiritually so that we might transcend any disappointment we experience. Help us during this season of giving to pour out what we have to offer with generous compassion for all your suffering children. Meet us today, God, where we are, and then equip us for the trials yet to come and the joys yet to be revealed. In the name of the coming Christ, we pray these things. Amen. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. 
Who is this King of glory? How shall we call him? He is Emmanuel, the promised of ages. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. In all of Galilee, in city or village, he goes among his people, curing their illness. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Sing then of David, son, our Savior, and brother in all of Galilee was never another the king of glory comes the nation rejoices open the gates before him lift up your voices Christ came to bring us salvation and has promised to come again let us pray that we may always be ready to welcome him. Come, Lord Jesus. That the keeping of Advent may open our hearts to God's love. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. That the light of Christ may penetrate the darkness of sin. Come, Come Lord Jesus. Jesus. That this wreath may constantly remind us to prepare for the coming of Christ. Come, Lord Jesus. That the Christmas season may fill us with peace and joy as we strive to follow the example of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Loving God, your church joyfully awaits the coming of its Savior, who enlightens our hearts and dispels the darkness of ignorance and sin. During this Advent season, pour forth your blessings upon us as we light the candles of this wreath. May their light reflect the splendor of Christ, who is Lord forever and ever. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope, May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. you would tear open the heavens and come down. Mountains would quake before you like fire igniting brushwood or making water boil. If you would make your name known to your enemies, the nations would tremble in your presence. When you accomplished wonders beyond all our expectations, when you came down, mountains quaked before you. From ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God but you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You look after those who gladly do right. They will praise you for your ways. But you were angry when we sinned. You hid yourself when we did wrong. We have all become like the unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a minstrel rag. All of us wither like a leaf. Our sins, like the wind, carry us away. No one calls on your name. No one bothers to hold on to you. For you have hidden yourself from us and have handed us over to our sin. But now, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. All of us are the works of your hand. Don't rage so fiercely, Lord. Don't hold our sins against us forever. 
but gaze now on your people, all of us. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Hear these words from Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always for you because of God's grace that was given to you in Jesus Christ. That is, you were made rich through him in everything, in all your communication and every kind of knowledge in the same way that the testimony about Christ was confirmed with you. The result is that you aren't missing any spiritual gift while you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also confirm your testimony about Christ until the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and you were called by him to partnership with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord.
From the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. In those days, after the suffering of that time, the sun will become dark and the moon won't give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then they will see the human one coming in the clouds with great power and splendor, And then he will send the angels and gather together his chosen people from the four corners of the earth, from the end of the earth to the end of heaven. Learn this parable from the fig tree. After its branch becomes tender and it sprouts new leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know that he's near at the door. I assure you that this generation won't pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will certainly not pass away. But nobody knows when that day or hour will come. Not the angels in heaven and not the Son. Only the Father knows. Watch out. Stay alert. You don't know when the time is coming. It is as if someone took a trip and left the household behind and put the servants in charge, giving each one a job to do, and told the doorkeeper, stay alert. Therefore, stay alert. You don't know when the head of the household will come, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows in the early morning or at daybreak. Don't let him show you up when you weren't expecting and find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, stay alert. This This is is the the word word of the the Lord. So, what would you do if your world were about to come to an end? Now, I know that that's a very strange way for me to begin the sermon this morning, but when you think about it, that is the question that is just begging to be asked this morning when we read these words from Mark's gospel. What would you do if your world were about to come to an end? In those days, after the suffering of that time, the sun will become dark and the moon won't give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken. And, when they will, and then they will see the human one coming in clouds with great power and splendor. What would you do if your world were about to come to an end. Now, I'm a preacher, and so I read these words every day. But when I read these passages, the first place where I want to go when I first read them is straight to that place of, "Uh uh-oh, Jesus is coming, and we're all in big trouble right now. But in truth, Christians have long been fascinated by what we call apocryphal writings. Writings that speak about the end times, when God will come in all of God's final glory and splendor and put a stop to all of our nonsense here on earth. We've been fascinated for centuries by these passages, and we have even gone to great lengths over the years to attempt to decipher them. Some of us, just so that we can get a biblical leg up on maybe our next door neighbor, maybe feel a little superior about what we know, and others, well, there are others who have attempted to decipher these texts just for the malevolent joy of terrorizing and manipulating God's people. There was a man by the name of Harold Camping. Do you remember him? Remember that name? Who predicted and heavily promoted the end of the world 
on May the 21st, 2011. And then when that prediction failed, he said that he got his dates mixed up and connect, corrected the time to be October 21st. Hal Lindsey, remember that name? Hal Lindsey did the same thing a generation ago. Remember his book, The Late Great Planet Earth? That man scared the bejeebers out of my youth group. I had to talk with those kids for months about eschatology and the second coming theology, things that young people at that age aren't quite equipped to psychologically and emotionally handle. And then, of course, there was all that Y2K stuff. Remember that? And then, of course, the Mayan calendar, 2012. Across the ages, we Christians have been so obsessed with these passages in our holy text, so obsessed with trying to figure out the exact day and the exact time when the world will finally come to an end, that to outsiders of our faith, we often sound and sometimes even look like crackpots. Now, Let's not be too dismissive this morning of these apocryphal texts. There is some validity in what even crackpots have to say about all of this apocalyptic language. We just have to do some theology, some real theology first in order to get at that validity. And this is where I think the Gospel of Mark this morning can help us. I know that you have heard me say this in the past, but it really is true that I love the Gospel of Mark. I love this Gospel. I cut my theological teeth in seminary on the Gospel of Mark, and I have never been the same since. Mark is the earliest of our Gospel writers. His writings appeared sometime around maybe 65, 70 AD, Common Era. And just in case you have forgotten, let me also remind us today that Mark is the gospel writer who can best be described as terse and no-nonsense. He doesn't have time for pretty stories about angels and, and long parables about vineyards or talents or people going away on journeys like Luke or like Matthew. Mark comes right to the point in his story of Jesus, a point that can often be piercing and sometimes just downright offensive. Today he cuts to the chase when it comes to predicting when heaven and earth will pass away. And he writes, but nobody knows when that day or hour will come. Now, you see what I mean about being terse and to the point? Nobody knows, he says, nobody. Nobody on earth and no one in heaven, and not even the angels. And this is a surprise this morning, not even Jesus. Nobody but God. In his not-so-subtle way, this gospel writer lets us know that it is sheer arrogance to think that human beings are somehow privy to the mind of God. Nobody knows, declares Mark. Now that being said, it's important to remember how people thought about such things in the days when Mark was writing. Remember, 65 to 70, common era, 30, maybe 40 years after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. In Mark's time, there were at least two traditions in the very early Christian church about when Jesus would return. David Loos writes, these traditions were so prevalent in the early church that Mark simply couldn't ignore them. Some believed that Jesus' return was imminent, that he could return any day, while others, in response to the already longer-than-expected delay, remember, we're talking 30, 40 years after the crucifixion-resurrection event, 
Um, in response to the already longer than expected delay and the death of many of the original eyewitnesses to Jesus' life and ministry, believed Jesus would return at the culmination of human history, an event that would occur at the end of all time. Two different viewpoints in the church. And it's evident that Mark knew of these two opposing views. But rather than choose one view over another in his writing or attempt to reconcile them in some way, Mark chose instead to offer Christians a third possibility. In today's reading, Mark includes a subtle allusion to the final scenes leading up to Jesus' death. And that allusion is so subtle that you may not have caught it earlier, so let me read it to you now. You don't know when the head of the household will come, whether in the evening, which is an allusion to the Last Supper, or at midnight, which is an allusion to the Garden of Gethsemane, or when the rooster crows in the early morning, which is an allusion to Peter's denial, or at daybreak, the time of Jesus' trial before Pilate. Here's why this part of scripture is so important. There are scholars who speculate that with this illusion, Mark is intentionally, in his version of Jesus' life, depicting Jesus as declaring that his return is precisely at the moment when he is nailed to the cross and we see God's love poured out for us and for all the world. That moment when the heavens shake and the sun darkens. Again, David Loos, whatever, whenever, and however the end of the world may come, that end is realized in the form of a man who goes to a cross out of love for us. For this reason, theologians across the ages declared Jesus' cross as the pivotal point of history, for at that moment, one age ended and another began. It's so important to do theology, real theology, when we read these passages. And here's why. Mark is declaring the possibility that Jesus has already returned and that the world as we know it is already passing away and a new heaven and a new earth is beginning to take its place. And that's why we are asked to be on the lookout for stars beginning to fall and new leaves growing on fig trees because the kingdom of heaven is already here, it is already now, and it is yet to come. And our job is to see it. Our job is to recognize it going on around us. So let's go back to the question that I posed at the very beginning of this sermon. What would you do if your world were about to come to an end? Life is short and life is sweet. And it may be shorter and sweeter than we think. And I don't mean to be indelicate here today, just poignantly honest. When I say that for some of us, the world could very well end tomorrow. I think we know and we understand that reality here in this sanctuary, especially when on a Sunday morning we share our joys and our concerns in the service and the list of memorials and the list of mission candle remembrances and those in the hospital is so long, so very long. I don't mean to be flip this morning when I say that there's more than one person in this room today who's actually joked with me about their bucket list. And that's why the question we are wrestling with this morning is so important. What would you do if your world were about to end tonight, tomorrow? David Lose asks, would you reconcile with a long-lost friend or family member? Would you finish a project that started years ago? Would you tell your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren or maybe your parents that you love them? 
one last time? Would you wrap your beloved in one long and tender embrace? What would you do? Asking and answering this question has a way of clarifying our values and sharpening our priorities, and it's not a bad question to ask as we move, or is it careen from the festivities of Thanksgiving to the headlong dash into Christmas? Why? Because it's easy to get so caught up in the cultural pressure to have that perfect Christmas, that we can lose a sense not only of what Christmas is supposed to mean, but actually that sense of ourselves as Christians. Now, I'm not going to go off on a tear this morning about the true meaning of Christmas and how we all get too caught up in the secular celebrations of this season. I love the week's before Christmas just as much as anyone else in this room. And so I'm not going to be a Grinch this morning. But rather, I do want to suggest to you this morning that somewhere in the midst of all of your planning and your decorating, in the midst of all of your shopping and your cooking and your baking and your partying, that you take a moment Take a moment and really think about the question that I asked at the beginning of the sermon. What would you do if your world were about to end? And then promise yourself. Promise yourself that this Advent season, while you watch and you wait and you hope for the cry of that newborn babe in the manger, that you will do at least one of the things that you said you would do if the stars began to fall from heaven tomorrow. I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because I love it and because I used to be Lutheran. Did you know that when he was once asked what he would do if he believed that the world would end tomorrow, Martin Luther is said to have responded, I would plant a tree today. He was so sure of God's love for the world and so sure of God's promises about the future that he wasn't afraid to invest in a new future. He wasn't afraid. And we don't have to be either if the stars begin to fall. What would we do if the world were to end, if our world were to end? There's freedom, and there is power in that question, my friends, and we don't need to be afraid of it, as so many others of our time have suggested. For Christ has already come into our lives to bring a new world into being, for each and every single one of us so that we, in turn, might do the same for someone else. During this Advent season, we are given the opportunity to remember the powerful promise of another season in the church here, the Easter promise that boldly proclaims, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. So be on the lookout. Be on the lookout because the kingdom of heaven is here and it is now and stars are beginning to fall and my Lord, what a morning is dawning. Today and tomorrow and in the days to come of this Advent season, what lies ahead, my friends, is the opportunity to see our great and magnificent and wonderful God at work in the world, working for good for us, always working for good, and always inviting us to find a way to do the same. So watch and wait. And above all, live each day to the fullest so that the King of glory may come and the nation may rejoice.
Amen. My Lord, what a morning, my Lord, what a morning, oh my Lord, what a morning, when the stars begin to fall, you'll hear the trumpet sound to wake the nations. Looking to my God's right hand when the stars begin to fall. My Lord, what a morning! My Lord, what a morning! Oh, my Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to